Well, hello, everybody. I am Carol Howell with Let's Talk Dementia, and I am glad that you have tuned in today to this wonderful resource to get dementia education. And not just dementia education, but free dementia education. Well, my company is Let's Talk Dementia, and we are based out of Southwest Florida, and I am the Executive Director, Internationally Certified Dementia Practitioner, and Amazon Best-Selling Author. So I've been told I can do a one-minute commercial, so here it goes. <laughs> this is my Amazon, one of my many books. This one is Amazon number one bestseller named Let's Talk Dementia, and it's an easy-to-read caregiver's guide that will give you information on how to care for your loved one with dementia. See on the, this page right here. Ooh, I can't do this backwards. There we go. There's a smiley face. There are little jokes or funny stories ever so often throughout that journey of learning. That'll make you stop and giggle because you know what? You've got to giggle in this caregiving journey. Don't you agree? I know how hard it is, so we have to stop and laugh. I have several books, but this is my latest book. Ooh, the light's hitting it there. Reminisce and Worship. That's my mama's hands. And it is a 90-day or 30-day devotional that will show a, a brightly colored picture and then there's a scripture and then conversation about the scripture and the picture. You can find everything that we produce on our website, letstalkdementia.org, as well as Amazon. Have a, uh, best, besides our bestsellers, we have a podcast and a video series and um, iTunes, uh, YouTube, uh, Spotify, all those good things, but you can also find them on our website. All right. End of commercial. Now let's get to work. So my my great pleasure is to begin this series for you, and I'm going to kind of hit the high spots on some things, and coming behind me will be some wonderful speakers who will speak in detail on specific topics. But I like to present dementia education in a way that is easy to understand. I use very few big sound and important words. I know them, but so what? What I want to be able to do is to give you information that's going to stick in your little pea brain and you're going to be able to pull it out one day when you need it and that will make you a better caregiver and you know what when you're a better caregiver your loved one is happier and you know what else when they're a happier you're happier and back full circle you're a better caregiver but when you have a breakdown in that is when we feel like our well as my sister used to say our head's going to spin top of our head's going to spin off Flames are going to spew out, and we don't look good like that. So I've got to keep you all happy and feeling good and energized and believing in yourself. Now, I know about this caregiving journey. My sweet mama, Miss Vera Jean Holder, was diagnosed with dementia in August of 2006. Now, my mama's diagnosis came through by a phone call. Oh, yeah, a phone call. You know, sometimes you just wonder if they should not spend a lot of time in medical school on bedside manner or how to bring about information to family members they might not want to hear because this doctor, well, he didn't do so good. But I got this phone call that said, Miss Howell, just calling to tell you that your mother has dementia. Well, I was making my bed, my husband and I, making a king-size bed at that time, so he was away on the other side of the bed, and I got that news and I just stood there for a minute and I said, so are you telling me my mama has the symptoms of dementia or she might get dementia? Or what are you saying? He said, oh no, she has dementia, but don't worry about it. I'm going to call you in some medicine and everything's going to be all right. Really? Because see, grandma, my mama's mama, grandma had Alzheimer's, was living in Florida and pretty much she didn't know what was going on in her world. And if he was going to call in some medicine for Mama, why didn't they call that in for Grandma? So I did two things right then. I realized I didn't like this doctor, and I found a new doctor. And the other thing I did was begin my study on dementia. So after I hung up from that phone call, I sat down on the edge of the bed. My husband looked at me. He said, what's wrong? I said, the doctor just said Mama has dementia. And he goes, oh, he didn't just say it like that. What else did he say? I said, no, that's what he said. So, you know, that, that was not a good way to present that information. And he certainly could not prescribe medicine that was going to make it better, unfortunately. That was not true then, and it's still not true today. 
So I did begin studying and learning about dementia because my mama was and still is my very best friend in the world. Mama went to heaven on May 31st, but she's still my heart, right? She, everybody says, she was your mama. No, she still is my mama. She always going to be my mama. <laughs> but she did pass from advanced Alzheimer's after 13 years in, on her journey. But I did begin my study because my mama was working full time. And as I tell folks, she could sell ice to an Eskimo. She convinced them not only do they need one bag of ice, but probably 10 or 12. And they didn't even know they came to buy ice. That's my mama. She could sell. And then when my mama would get her paycheck, she would spend it on me. And I like that. <laughs> she loved to shop. And if she needed new jeans, I needed new jeans. So I had to get mama back to work. We had to figure out about this dementia business. And that's what I did when I did what all good Americans do when you want to know something. I Googled it because you know if it's on Google. Girlfriend, it is gospel. You can depend on it 100%. No, you cannot. But I did learn there was this thing called a reversible dementia. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I'm a woman of faith. My company is a faith-based not-for-profit. Everything I do revolves around who I know holds tomorrow. So I started praying, Lord, please, if mama's going to have dementia, let it be one of those reversible dementias. We'll get her fixed, get her back to work. Amen. That was my prayer. And the Lord just giggled. You know, they say if you want to make God laugh, make plans. <laughs> mama did not have a reversible dementia. Mama had an irreversible dementia known as Alzheimer's. Well, let's take a minute and stop, though, and talk about what is dementia. Well, if you read lots of books, and there's lots of books out there. There were lots of books when I started writing mine. There are way more now. But some of them are just so medically bound. You're just like, oh, I don't get all that. And you put it, you, you don't finish it. And my books are not like that. So I, I write like I talk, very plain very southern. So dementia is the inability to think clearly. Uh-oh, raise your hand if you got that problem. Oh yes, I do. Come out of the finger. Cut my foot, broke my fingernail this morning putting my Spanx on. <laughs> I told you you got to laugh. You know, when you're pulling your Spanx up, and for all you skinny people who don't know what Spanx are, well you can Google it. Tore my fingernail. I mean, that was some pressure on that thing. <laughs> so if you've had problem concentrating on life, eh, maybe that's not just the definition of dementia. There's got to be more to it than that because we all do that. We all have moments where we go, where did I put my phone? And lots of times you're going, where did I put my phone? The whole time you're holding your phone. Have you ever done that? Well, that's not dementia. Dementia is the inability to think clearly that a affects the activities of daily living. Well, what is it that I do that you do? I mean, if you live in the household with other people, they do something different than you every day. So what are the activities of daily living? Well, you can remember them by the acronym BEAD, like the beads on a necklace, B-E-A-D, beads on a necklace. There are five activities of daily living, but BEAD only has four letters, and that just is like life. There's just always something messing up my plan. But the acronym BEAD, B-E-A-D, and we're going to put a T on the end, which makes my acronym spell not a single solitary thing, but that is life. B stands for bathing. We all bathe. Now, some of us have got to get a shower and stay in there till all the hot water's gone. That's me. Some of us want to sit in the bathtub and just lay in there till you shrivel up. Some of us are just going to take a washcloth and wash up, whatever, but we bathe. Now, bathing becomes a problem with folks with dementia. Did you know that? Well, it does. And we're going to talk about that in detail here in just a minute. So the first activity, activity of daily living is B, bathing. The second one is E, which is eating. Girlfriend, I'm good at eating. I've lost 100 pounds and got books about it. But eating becomes a problem with our folks with dementia. B is bathing. E is eating. A is ambulating or moving from point A to point B. And I don't care if you're in a wheelchair. You still don't stay in that same four square feet of your world. You move around. We all ambulate to some in some way. B is bathing. E is eating. A is ambulating. D is dressing. Yep, we all dress. Some of us, not so good. And if you don't believe that, go to Walmart at night. That will crack you up. It will also make you think, really? Did you wear that? 
B is bathing, E is eating, A is ambulating, and D is dressing. And do you want to guess what T is? And it's something we all do. And no, it's not talking. It's toileting. We all go potty. And if you don't, woo, you don't feel so good. So all these bathing, eating, ambulating, dressing, and toileting are the five activities of daily living. Well, the dementia is the inability to think clearly that affects at least two of those five activities of daily living. When we start to have problems focusing, performing, participating in our world because we can't think clearly and we see it's affecting at least two of those five activities that we all do in some form, the doctor's going to call it dementia. Well, before you walk out the doctor's door and before he hands you a prescription for Aricept, and believe me, this happens a lot, stop him and go, whoa, I heard this woman with a southern accent one day tell me that there's over 200 types of dementia. And that's true. When I started my company back when mom was diagnosed in 2013, there were over 75 dementias. Today, there's over 200 kinds of dementias where you can't think clearly. It's affecting your activities of daily living. So if we go to the doctor and we're instantly diagnosed with Alzheimer's just by walking in and doing that precious little mini, mini mental status exam, and they go, yep, you got Alzheimer's, you say, no, 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 there is more to it than that. I need more testing. We need to rule out what it's not and then tell me it's Alzheimer's. But you don't just go and go, your mama can't think clearly. She, you know, went to Walmart yesterday and couldn't figure out how to get home and walk out with the prescription for Aricept. Don't do that. Because if there's over 200 kinds of dementia, you need to know which one your loved one has. And I do believe I mentioned to you that there's this thing called a reversible dementia. So what if mom's not remembering well because she has a reversible dementia and you've just given her medicine, chemicals for Alzheimer's? Does that make sense to you? Well, no, it doesn't. So we want to make sure that we are going to the doctor. We're beginning that process to learn, but we are continuing in that study. We're going to have blood work done. They're going to do a psychological evaluation, probably going to do some brain scans. They're going to find out what's going on, what is not happening. It's not Parkinson's. It's not Lewy body. You didn't have a stroke. You don't have heart disease. All these different things. Your blood looks good. Your numbers are all normal. They're going to start these this big funnel and they're going to work their way down till the only thing that may be left is Alzheimer's. And unfortunately, that's what mama's was. So let's talk about those activities of daily living in a little more detail here and how they affect life when you have dementia. So B was bathing. You remember that one? B, uh, bathing becomes a problem with folks with dementia. Now, why is that? How is it a problem? Well, with bathing uh, with someone with dementia, they may not want to take a bath. We see this a lot as we get about mid-stage dementia. I divide dementia up into three categories, and I think the Alzheimer's Association does too. I call it um, beginning, middle, late, um, or early, mid, late. So somewhere around mid-stage, we kind of just don't want to take a bath. Now, as our loved ones age, um, unless they're very active, they probably don't need to bathe as much as we do um, if they're, you know, at home more and they're not out doing and going. But certainly our folks that are um, in the throes of their dementia who are spending their days pretty much, you know, maybe just around the house and not very active, they don't need to be bathed all the time. You're just wearing down their skin two or three times a week. It's fine. But bathing becomes a problem because they won't do that many times. Oh, no, I am not taking my clothes off in front of you. You can just leave here. I brought you into this world. I'll take you out. Don't start unbuttoning my shirt. I'm not doing it. And no, you're not washing anything. And we've got spitting and we've got flailing of arms and we've got curse words ooh, coming out of mom's mouth. <laughs> and we don't know what to do about it. Well, there. It's all in your approach, and your approach is important in everything you do in life. End of story. Amen. 
Yes, amen. Because how we approach things and people will affect the outcome. And that's still true with dementia. So we need to think about how we approach that. We need to realize, um, without going into a lot of detail about how to bathe, but you need to realize that folks with dementia are losing their peripheral vision. That's right. Their ability to look straight ahead and see right to left, top to bottom, and not move their eyes one bit, right? And you would be surprised if you, as I'm 58 years old, is that right? Yeah, no, I'm 59 years old. Yeah, 59, 58. How old am I? I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, you would realize, it's, it, it would be interesting for you to realize that if you stand beside someone 20 years younger than you and you put your hands as far out as you can put them till you can't see them and you start bringing them in little by little until you can see them, then you look at someone 20 to 25 years younger than you stand beside you do it, their peripheral vision is wider than yours. It's just part of aging. It's it will ha what happens with the eyes. But remember, peripheral vision is right to left and top to bottom. Now, when you're driving down the road, that peripheral vision is very important, isn't it? It's what keeps you safe as you drive. You can be driving along, and there can be this truck coming back here, and while you're keeping your eye on the interstate, you see that truck, and you're aware of it. Peripheral vision is important. Peripheral vision becomes very important in bathing because, think about this, you get your loved one in the shower. Now, do not, do not put your loved one in the bathtub. Not unless you're planning on leaving them in the bathtub or hiring help to come get them out of the bathtub because they're not going to be safe. You're not going to be able to get them out easily. They probably are not going to be able to follow your direction to get them out. It's going to be like handling a slippery octopus. It's going to be, that's just not going to be good. So we're going to put them on a shower chair. You can buy it at Walmart. They're just everywhere that is seated in the shower. And we're going to have a shower head that comes down on the cord, like shower massage, you know, that we can bring the head down and rinse the body. And we're going to realize that when we set them down there, especially if we don't have that shower massage down at their level where they can see it, the water's going to fall from this unknown source. Now remember, when you look straight ahead, you can see my hand up there. But when they look straight ahead, they're probably not seeing it, and that's a problem. Not only does the peripheral vision get smaller, but with Alzheimer's, it brings it even smaller, top to bottom, right to left. Then you've got to think folks have cataracts, they have macular degeneration. There's all kinds of reasons that the vision is blurry, right? So all of a sudden, water falls from where the HD double toothpick did that come from? Get it out of here, you, you, blah, blah, blah. We got words coming, and you're not touching me because we what we've done is scared them. Something's falling from this unknown source. You've taken my clothes off. I'm sitting here naked. I'm cold. I'm angry. And you want me to be happy. It's not going to work. So don't do that. So bathing becomes a problem. But well, how can we fix that problem? I'm not going to leave you hanging on fixing that problem. Well, we've got them on the shower chair. We've got that shower massage, and we're going to bring it down before we get, in, get them in there and get that water warmed up. You know how you used to test the water on your arm to make sure it was, or the milk to make sure it's the right temperature before you fed your baby? Well, you might want to do it without that shower water. How's it feel on the inside of your arm? And we're going to put it in the floor and let it be warming up the floor and get them on that shower chair covered up, maybe in one of those big old furry bathrobes that you can open up, or maybe a couple bath towels, whatever they're comfortable with, and start at their feet. And we're going to show them, look, here I've got warm water. I'm just going to put it on your feet. Now, if they're resistant to getting in that shower, you want to feed them their favorite snack while they're sitting there. Now, if this happens to me one day, you buy some M&Ms, I'm not going to give you any trouble getting a bath because I'd be loving some M&Ms, right? And the more that bath happens successfully, you just keep handing them M&Ms. And if it begins to be a problem, you kind of step back and maybe just get them warm and feed them some M&Ms. Talk to them, maybe sing with them while you're bathing them. But you're going to show them that water down at their feet and you're not going to startle them. There's lots of ways to continue with talking about bathing, but that's not my job right now. 
So with bathing, bathing becomes a problem because often we're scared. We think we have bathed when we haven't bathed. We think we haven't bathed when we have had a client that was bathing and shaving two and three times a day, just ruining his skin because he forgot that he'd done it. So bathing is the first activity of daily living. The B is bathing. The second one, E, is eating. Now, how does eating become a problem? Well, it's similar in bathing that we think we have not eaten when we have. We think we have eaten when we have not. And I said for years, based on my mama's history with food, that there's a good chance my mom would wind up um, dying of starvation. She would starve to death. And I told my sisters that, and they were not happy to hear that. But my mama went from weighing just uh, 199 pounds at one point in her life to down to about 118 at another point in her life. And my mama was either going, you know, 80 miles an hour or she was zero miles an hour. There was no middle ground for mama. So eating did become a problem. In the last 24 days of my mama's life, she didn't eat one single solitary bite. She'd had very little for about two weeks before that, eating becomes a problem. Um, my grandmother, on the other hand, her mama who had Alzheimer's, she would sit down and eat a complete meal, and then she'd go, what is in that blue bowl? And, well, Grandma, that's mashed potatoes. And she'd be like, well, I don't think I had any. And she'd work her way through the table and eat some more. So eating can be a problem by wanting to eat all the time or not wanting to eat at all. I walked into assisted livings and walked out of the dining room with someone on my arm after they just finished lunch and they would stop and go, do you have any idea when they're going to feed us? <laughs> well, you're walking out of the dining room with a full belly right now, but we don't remember that. So B is bathing and E is eating. A is ambulating. Now, why is that a problem with um, dementia? Well, realizing there are different kinds of dementia, uh, ambulating may be affected differently, well, is affected differently depending on the kind of dementia. But what we find is back to that peripheral vision. Now, we talked about how it changes right to left and top to bottom as we age, and it is drastically affected when we um, have dementia. But what we see is folks with dementia are walking around, and they're doing so with their head down. They're looking at the floor, and we think, hmm, they must have some back issues and because they're all bent over and they probably do because they've been walking like this a lot um, but they're probably and more likely seeking the floor because see when I walk I can look ahead and I know the floor is down there I know that if I move my feet forward I'm safe they don't see the floor they don't know that there's floor there. And I can guarantee you, you will not walk with someone, even in late stage um, Alzheimer's, who will not look down. They will look down to make sure the floor is there, and they're not going to put their foot where there's not a floor. If you've got those great big black mats in front of your door of your business, you know, that say welcome or whatever, it's not a good thing. Our individuals with dementia look at those big black mats, and they think, hole. That's a hole. I can't step in the hole. And you go walking, you know, right straight across that mat, that hole. They get scared. They don't know why you would do that. You don't know why they're upset. They won't walk across the mat. And we just got a big problem where if we had just put a cream colored mat, it would not have looked like a hole. Ambulating is a problem. So they're bent over. They're seeking the floor because they can't see it peripherally and it slows them down. That's just one of the reasons that ambulating can be a problem. So B is bathing, E is eating, A is ambulating, and D is dressing. Like I said, some folks just have an issue with that. I am pretty sure we need to start a fund to buy full-length mirrors for a lot of people. They just need to stop and look about what they look like with what they put on. Were they asleep? Don't you wonder that? Well, our folks with dementia have a problem with dressing. And, you know, sometimes when I think about it, 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 it makes sense to me because what happens is we move mom to an assisted living, right? And mom gets up and goes to breakfast and she sits down there just freezing because we keep these buildings too cold in the summertime, do we not? Yeah, we do. We keep them comfortable for the staff. And then in the winter, we've still got staff in there just to work in we got the heat on, but it's nothing to the level that our loved ones need because they're cold. And what do they do? 
They go back to their apartment. They pull out a sweatshirt and then a sweater on top of that and their furry boots. You know, there's just no telling what people might have on. Whereas if we kind of thought about the temperatures a little bit, we might would think about the people that are being affected. As you age, you lose the fat pads under your skin. I'm pretty much never going to lose mine. That's what I've decided. I've lost 100 pounds. The rest of them going to stay forever. But we do lose our fat pads under our skin that protect us, our, our skin from our, our nerves. Our nerves are protected because of the fat pad. Well, as that fat pad becomes thinner, the nerves are more sensitive and we feel things differently. So if you scratch my arm, I'm going to sit here and let you do it all day long because that feels good. But if you scratch your loved one's arm, who is in their 80s, even healthy, it feels different and it might not feel comfortable. So you got to think about that. Um, so where was I? Well, we're doing, we did bathing, we did eating, we did ambulating, we were doing dressing. <laughs> kind of forgot where I was there for a minute. So what feels good for us might not be enough for our loved ones with, with dementia. So they need to load up on clothes. Or you call them and you tell them, you know, I'm going to come pick you up and we're going to go to 11 o'clock worship. Now that's the formal worship, Mama. You know, you got to look good for that or they're going to talk about you. And believe it or not, when you get there the next morning, Mama's up getting dressed. Well, hallelujah, that's a shock right there. But, you know, she's got on shorts and a tank top, and you didn't even know she owned one. And she don't have on a bra, and she got on flip-flops, and it's December, and you're going to 11 o'clock worship. You see how dressing becomes a problem? Oh, my, it's interesting. B is bathing, E is eating, A is ambulating, D is dressing, and T, I told you, is toileting, going potty. We know that's a problem. Now, when you don't go potty, it's a problem for you. If you're having a problem urinating and you wind up with a UTI or, or a, a, a bladder infection, oh my goodness, I had the entire thing infected one time. Oh, it was horrible. It's not fun. Or if you deal with constipation, it's not fun. It is painful. It is not only painful, but in someone who has dementia, it will make their dementia worse. Someone who does not have dementia can actually develop the signs of dementia because they're constipated or they have a UTI. Uh, the leading reversible dementia, the number one reason for dementia that can be reversed is a UTI in an otherwise healthy senior citizen. It's that painful. We get the UTI cleared up, the dementia goes away. But if we've got someone who has dementia and they are constipated or they have a UTI, it's like pouring gasoline on the fire. Boy, all bets are off. What happened yesterday, the way they were yesterday, is not how they're going to be today. And until we get that UTI cleared up or we get them to pottying, it's not going to be better. So, our loved ones, too, the, the signal between their brain and their bowel, their brain and their bladder, it, it's not working right. Because why? Because the brain is dying. The brain is diseased, and it cannot send all those signals that it needs for life and for the body and the bodily functions to happen as they should. So the brain's not saying, hmm, I do think I need to go pee-pee. Let me stop and go to the bathroom brain's not sending that signal. So if the brain's not sig sending the signal and the urine comes out, it's got to go somewhere, right? <laughs> See the problem? And then the same is for a bowel movement. You know, you start getting that feeling in your belly and you're like, I think I might need to be excused for a little bit. Um, the brain doesn't send that signal. And if the signal goes through, the body's not recognizing it as I believe that's telling me I need to use the bathroom. They may feel it, but they may not be able to discern, get up and go to the bathroom. It may just be, well, my belly's making some grumbly. So that whole circle of events, it, it may or may not happen. And by the time it does happen, it's too late. So we have incontinence. So that's how those activities of daily living can be a problem with someone with dementia. That's just a few of the ways. We could take each of those and give you even more examples of how it affects life, but you kind of get the idea there. So that's what dementia is. So then we've been diagnosed with dementia and we're not walking out of the doctor's office until we've started the process to find out what kind of dementia. And the leading kind of dementia 
irreversible dementia is Alzheimer's. If you take everybody that has reason number two through over 200 and you add them up, they will not equal the number of people who have the leading cause of dementia, which is Alzheimer's. And that's where that's why so many doctors just lump them all in the same thing. But it's not the same. It's kind of like saying a runny nose is always a cold. Well, you know that's not true. Let's see, you can get a runny nose because you just got bad news and you've been crying. Or you just got good news and you've been crying. Or maybe you just had jalapenos and it made your nose run, right? Or maybe you smell pepper. Maybe you've got allergies. There's a lot of reasons that you could have a runny nose that you do not need medication for. You just need to get through that situation. And there are a lot of reasons you can have dementia. And some of them, well, some of them don't require Aricept. Because I told you, a urinary tract infection can cause it. So that we need an antibiotic for, right? Your blood sugar being high or your blood sugar being low, your thyroid being off, you might be drunk, you might be high on drugs, you may be having a side effect of drugs, you could have vitamin B as in boy deficiency, you could have vitamin D as in dog deficiency. Uh-huh. See that you could have cancer somewhere in your body. You could have a tumor somewhere in your body. There are so many reasons you could have dementia that are not Alzheimer's. And many of those are, can be fixed. Most of those that I just told you about can be fixed. And then the irreversible irreversibles besides Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Lewy body disease, Huntington's, Pick's disease, AIDS, stroke. Are we going to prescribe the leading medicine for Aricep for somebody who's had a stroke? No. So don't leave the doctor's office till the process has begun to discern not just, yes, mom has dementia, but why mom has dementia. And you're not going to find that out in one visit. You're just not. It is a process, and you need to go through that right? Okay. Amen. I have said recently, I'm going to get me an amen buzzer made. You know, that every time I press it, it goes, amen, Carol. <laughs> well, those are just some good, good things to think about in the diagnosis process and beginning that journey. But I want to take it just a little bit further. I've told you what dementia is. I want to finish up by telling you simply what Alzheimer's is. Well, as I said, I speak in simple terms, and I think you figured that out. Alzheimer's, simply put, is a disease of the brain, okay? And there's lots of reasons you can have a disease or something going on in the brain that we don't want. A closed head injury is one of them. I think about football players and soccer players. 50% increased chance of Alzheimer's if you've had a blow to the head. I tell you, helmets, I, I ride a recumbent trike, you know, a trike three wheels now y'all and it's recumbent so I'm laid back just to tool down the road and I have to wear a dang helmet to keep my husband happy I'm like honey if I fail I just go flunk I wouldn't go far he said we're not hitting your head we got to protect your head so um yeah there's a lot of a lot of reasons that you can have dementia and Alzheimer's is one blow to the head all these others that we've mentioned so what is Alzheimer's? A disease of the brain. So what goes on in the brain? Well, the main thing I want you to, to realize, and this will help you in your caregiving journey, is in the very center of the brain. If you did a, you know, put one of those hats on that have an arrow, you know, like a, a, a um, Valentine's, that's it. And one went this way, one went this way, and then you put one this way, where they intersect about in the center of your brain is your hippocampus. Now that's my big word for the day, hippocampus. It's a two-lobed seahorse shaped part of the brain and everything you hear in the day that you didn't know, anything I've told you that's news. It might be big news or it might just be you need to stop by the store and buy milk on the way home, maybe little things. Um, anything new lands on the hippocampus and in a healthy hippocampus, it stays there until you go to sleep. When you go to sleep and you dream, and then you wake up and think, why in the world did I dream that? <laughs> but when you dream, it leaves your hippocampus and it goes somewhere else in your brain to live where it stays forever. Your hippocampus is like a cardboard file box. It's a temporary storage place. The rest of your brain is like a big metal file drawer where you put things that you're going to keep forever. So what happens is about as much as 20 years before the first symptom of dementia ever occurred within that person, as much as 20 years before, Alzheimer's took it 
took its first bite of the brain. And that first bite is always on the hippocampus. It likes that. Had that first bite went, this tastes a bit like cheesecake. I like cheesecake. <laughs> or maybe it was French fries. It's my two favorite things. And so it just camped out there for a while. And then it might have taken a break. And then it ate some more. And then it ate some more. And then one day it went, let's try somewhere else. And it started eating a few other spots of the brain. And the more that damage happened and the more it occurred, then the person to which it was happening to began to have some outward manifestation of what was going on in the brain. Okay, so it had to be enough damage to the brain to start affecting that person. But the first thing that happened was the hippocampus was, was affected first, and that's where new information lands. So that's why your loved one um, with dementia cannot remember squat deadly do. I don't care how hard they may want to remember, how important it is that they remember, they can't because that information is landing on their hippocampus and it cannot be processed. It's got to leave the hippocampus and go somewhere else to live, but it can't. The hippocampus is diseased. The connections that allow it to move from point A to point B are down, or else it's landed in a hole, a physical hole in the hippocampus, and it's just gone. They can't remember it. You being mad at them because they can't remember it is kind of like being mad at somebody who has heart disease that their heart doesn't work. Well, we wouldn't do that, but we do get angry at our people with dementia because they can't remember. Mm, let's not do that. That's not a good plan. So Alzheimer's starts in the hippocampus, and then it works its way out. And we know that at the point of death, only one-third of the brain matter remains in the brain, in the head. Two-thirds of the brain is gone like Elvis. It's left the building. What goes with that two-thirds? Well, education, memories, family, humor, stories, everything that makes them, them, you, you, your personality. It's held in the brain, and when two-thirds of the brain is gone, then a whole lot of who they are has left. Are we going to be nice to these people? Oh, yes, we are. And that's why you have tuned into this series. And there's a lot of great information that's going to be released and, and provided for you. And I am glad to be part of it. I hope I've brought to you some information that has sparked your interest. And I hope that in your caregiving journey, that you will always bring smiles and joy into the life of your loved one. If there's one thing I want to leave you with besides reminding you that God's going to take care of all of us, it's that bringing happiness into your loved one's life, I don't care what's going on with you, will make their day better. Your head might be about to explode. You might just have a runny nose and a cold and all stopped up. You might have just gotten some bad news. You don't want that to land on your loved one with dementia. You want it all to be Disney World happy, happy teacup ride. And if you can keep your interactions with them on a positive note, then it's going to make life better for you. And that's really important when you don't feel good, isn't it? So I understand what that's like. And I know how hard it is to present that facade when you're just not feeling it. In the long run, it pays off. We've got to be good to our loved ones with dementia. They are dealing with a tough road. It's not easy for them. And if you think it is, you're wrong. You're just wrong. So I hope that you bring smiles into their life. But you know what else I hope? I hope they bring smiles into yours. And I hope that you will put yourself in a position that will allow them to interact with you in a fun and uplifting way, asking them questions about when they grew up and what their daddy did for a living. And did they go to college or about their first kiss, things like this, and singing with them the music they like. Well, you're going to learn a lot more in this series, and I thank you for joining me. And you can check me out at Let's Talk Dementia. Dot o -R -G. Blessings and smiles on your day. Bye.